Okay guys, we're going to talk through the setting of the inter-hospital transfer. So this is bread and butter, this is what we do. You guys will have done tons of transfers of patients either between ward uh, and the, the ICU or between emergency and scanners. But there's a few differences. We're going to be taking the patient off all of their monitoring, off all of their infusions and onto ours. So it's not just the same as sticking the equipment on the end of the bed and, and moving off. We need to move everything over. And we go to some pretty sick patients, so we need to be really aware of doing this in a safe manner. Because this is a risky time for the patients, and a time when if we lose monitoring, we can actually have problems. Do you mind holding that? Just make sure it doesn't fall. Um, so we've got um, a, an example here where we've got a septic patient who's at a small HDU ICU, and they need to go to another hospital, okay, another intensive care. So we're going to... We're going to have a phone conversation. That's the first contact we're going to have with the patient in any way, and that we're going to be you know, getting a call from MIU to say, could you please do this transfer? And at some point, we're going to be able to speak to the treating clinician, and we're going to be having a, a chat. And apart from hearing about the patient's uh, clinical status, we're going to be thinking about a few things that are common to all retrievals. Um, we're going to ask them to get some stuff ready, and that saves us time. If the patient needs resuscitation from your perspective, so if they need any other lines, they need to be intubated, absolutely essential that you talk about that before you get there if possible because obviously if that's done before you get there time's going to be saved if they can't do it then obviously you're going to need to do it yourself but most of the time the things that need doing are in the realm of the um, and the clinicians that are treating them they just maybe not thought about it for retrieval the um, other things that we are always going to need there's, there's three things really we're going to need to have a copy of the clinical records for the patient Okay, so that's always going to be essential. Um, and that can take some time to get ready and the scans need to be copied. We're going to need the copies of the scans. Um, we're always going to need to have infusions drawn up. And because we have them in syringe drivers, um, as opposed to running on a pump set, um, we need to have those drawn up. So that's the time to ask for it before you go. That way they can be ready for you when you arrive in the concentrations you like, ready to go. The third thing is that we're going to have fluid on a pump set. Um, and that's going to be our spare line that we're going to use to give drugs whenever we um, uh, are in, en route. So that needs to be prepared. Simple little things that can save you time. So now we're going to talk through the steps. So when we arrive in the, the hospital, we are, we're going to receive handover and uh, an update to the clinical condition of the patient. We're then going to assess the patient. And as a physician, that's our important role for us. It may be that everything's as advertised, the patient's stable and we don't need to do anything further. It's simply just moving the patient. But there, have been, there are many occasions when we arrive and we actually need to do quite a few things. Okay, we may need to even do some diagnostics to see if there's a difference in the patient's uh, clinical condition and we may make a new diagnosis and treat them accordingly. So that's important. Assessment, we're not going to uh, teach you guys to suck eggs, you guys know how to assess patients, but it just needs to be systematic and careful and thinking about the next uh, parts of the retrieval, the transport phase. We need to assess the airway in terms of if there's a tube in, if it's well secured, ch test the cuff, check the tubes not too far down either on x-ray or direct laryngoscopy, make sure they're ventilating both sides, the observations are good and B, C, D, E, checking all the lines and making sure they're well secured and we won't go any more into depth on that. The next issues are the, you can imagine there are a myriad of ways you can get a person from one stretcher to another with leads, with monitors, with infusions, with ventilator. So you need to have a, a system, otherwise you're on two different pages and it's all a big mess. So we want to avoid uh, spaghettification. So we, we, we like lasagna, we don't like spaghetti. We'll describe what that means in a moment. The, um, after you've assessed the patient and you've confirmed there's no further resuscitation, the paramedics are going to be setting the bridge up and getting stuff ready. Our job is then to look at all of the infusions and see what doesn't need to go with them. And so there's going to be some rationalisation of the infusions. Most ICUs you arrive, there's a Christmas tree of infusions, aren't there? There's MAG going, there's some potassium running, there's some insulin running, heparin. None of those things necessarily need to be transferred over and need to go with you. But obviously if they're inotrope or vasopressor dependent, that's very important. And if they're, they're going to need something to keep them asleep and sedated and uh, analgesic. So the... Um, the big thing we want to focus now is the patient who's pressor dependent. So we've arrived in this small hospital, they, this patient's hypotensive. We've assessed to see if there's anything we can fix. We may have done some fluid responsiveness tests, a straight leg raise, an IVC ultrasound, see whether there's, uh, it's worth giving fluid or, or pressors. We, we're happy that the diagnosis is fine, it's a pneumonia on x-ray and uh, the lactate's improving. And, and so 
We don't need to do any further diagnostics, but we're just going to optimise their treatment. If the patient is uh, on presses, we're going to need to swap over them, and that's a very crucial step in the transfer of the patient. And where if you take a shortcut, you're going to get into problems. So we, we have a very um, careful way of doing that. And you, anyone done changes over of presses in there? Treating, and what do you do? What, what? Yeah, good. So double pumping is, is the key to making sure there's a smooth transition. So let's say this, has a, this patient has 10 mils an hour running of single strength noradrenaline, that's 3 milligrams in 50 mils. And we've got a, a two hour trip to the, the hospital in, in, in the air. How are we going to get them over? What are we going to do? So you're going to connect up your own. Yeah, your so own we're going to have to have set. a completely separate infusion. Excellent. Yep. What concentration are we going to choose? And Nikki's syringes, you know, take 36 mils, 35 mils. So we've got 35 mils for the two hour trip. Yeah, good. So you're going to consider the, the strength, con, con, uh, you know, consistent with the length of tr trip you're doing. If it's a 20 minute drive, you're probably not going to need uh, the double strength, but if, it, if it's a long trip, double. So we've asked the nurse to drop double strength noradrenaline, so that's 6 milligrams in 50 mils, and we've discarded 13 mils, or we've dis decanted it to another syringe, so we've got it for the route. Now we're going to need to double pump. So what that really means is we need a spare line. Okay, we really don't recommend the sort of three-way tap thing because that can run into troubles. You can have you know, this tap being half open or a little bit open and, and cause problems. Why do we double pump? Why don't we simply just disconnect this, connect that up? There's a few seconds delay. Because that pump takes a while to come up to speed. Yeah, good. So there will be a delay even if you just do that rapid connection. Are there any other possible problems that could occur? Well, if you're using the new, complete new line, then there's going to be a dead space that you need to clear. Yeah, so it should be primed to the end, but yes. In the end, central line. The central and when you connect it to the central line, if it's to a new line, obviously there's a dead space in the central line. What about if that nurse got distracted whilst she's drawing up the noradrenaline and labelled the M&M &M noradrenaline? How are you ever going to discover that if you don't double pump? Once you disconnect and connect up, blood pressure drops, you start bolusing or adrenaline, which is actually M&M &M or saline or whatever. Nothing happens, nothing happens, you keep going. And you just, you'll run into a, a world of pain. So we want to be sure that the stuff coming out of there, going into the patient, is doing what it's advertised to do, which is make blood pressure go up. So we're going to slowly um, transfer the patient over. So let's have a go, our paramedics connected it up. Now because we've got double strength running, what, what rate are we going to choose as the initial rate? That's going to be a big question for us. So Half is the complete replacement therapy, so that's five mils an hour. But do we want to run both at full strength together? Because initially you're going to be getting quite a lot. No, so you can choose a lower dose. And we would typically go for half, okay? Just until we get some effect on the um, monitoring, then we can change over. So 2.5? That would be great. So now I've looked down and we've got some morphine and medaz. We've got some, uh, some insulin running and some norad. So I'm going to... Be very careful and make sure that I disconnect the appropriate one and make sure that uh, we're not disconnecting any of the important ones and uh, we're going to connect up to our own circuit. Okay, so now for me, everything else stops. We need to be absolutely sure that this has gone well. So I make sure no one touches any of the things. If I don't know how to run their syringe drive, I'll get a nurse to look after that. But what we don't want is people to helpfully start disconnecting things for you. So you need to take a real leadership role. And this is essential on the other side as well when you arrive in the ICU. So we've started that and we're waiting for it to work. And as soon as we have a blood pressure effect on this monitor, we go, okay, good. So now we can dial this one down. Sorry, Carol, can I just ask, you've disconnected the insulin yes. and connected NORAD. Yes. Is that right? So you're flushing through that. Yeah, if you're worried about it, the thing that's in the dead space, insulin doesn't worry me at all. But if it was something else that you'd be concerned about, then you're going to have to flush it very slowly through before you give it. So it's a good, good point. And then just another question. Um, you're obviously running your pump at two and a half mils. There's probably about a mil and a bit. Of yeah, there's around half a mil dead space in most uh, lines, but it depends on what other things are yeah, on top so of it. So your double pump could take about 15, 20 minutes before... Yeah, look, it, it shouldn't quite take that long, but yeah, if it, it's going to be a slow process. If you need to speed it up, you could run that at 20 mils an hour for um, 30 seconds, or you could even do a, a 0.1 or 0.2 bolus. But anything beyond that, is risking that <coughs> blood pressure spikes to 250 and you look away and you cringe and you wish you'd been more patient. You have to change yourself a bit. Yeah. <laughs> and it happens. You know, no, you if you... Go to it, and go, oh yeah, God. so you can imagine if it's an unclipped aneurysm, that's bad. So, 
patience is the, 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 the core uh, of this part. So now we've got some blood pressure effect, we're going to start turning that down and turning that up. And you can titrate that depending on how sick the patient is, slowly or quickly. So now we've got this fully turned off and that's running at 5 mils an hour. Okay, good. We can proceed with the rest of our transfer. The other big steps in the transfer are getting all the infusions on uh, onto the patient. We then need to get monitoring and then we need to get ventilation. The, um, if they have any bags that are hanging from the patient, the catheter bag, the nasogastric bag, we need to empty those. We don't want to be run, driving down the road with them sloshing about. And uh, you need to just remove anything extraneous, so central venous pressure lines or any other things that you don't need. Okay, so let's go through the process. We'll get some people to assist us. So the next step is we're going to go over with all our infusions. So we've got some M&M &M running, you know, or you've got Midaz and fentanyl. Those don't need to be double pumped. You know, you can even stop them for a minute. And uh, so we only had two lines going into the patient, so. Still stuck in there. And it's not, it's been removed. we've had a good look at the patient and made sure there's nothing extraneous hanging down. We've emptied all the bags. If we need to suction the tube, we've done it. So now we're gonna move our, our bed in and come a bit closer and we're gonna so the paramedics will usually be in charge of that aspect and very um, experienced at doing that. The next step is to go over on monitoring. And most commonly we're going to go over on monitoring before we get the patient over. But it depends on the setting you're in. Okay? Some people will do it the other way, but that's the most common. We'll go over with our monitoring. So in this case, because we're demonstrating to you, we're going to, we would have to take those leads off and put our leads on. We're going to go one monitoring modality at a time so that there's continuous monitoring throughout the retrieval. We don't want to pull our monitors off and then stick ours on and hope that they start working. The very last thing is obviously end tidal, which is going to be on the, the ventilator, and that's the last one to go over. But uh, bit by bit... This is, this is often when we engage the nurse as well, or the nurses, and say, okay, I'm going to take my pulse oximeter off, you take yours off, and they pull the tube out so that when you get a move, you don't find these tubes you didn't know were still there and you're all caught up. So, so it's just one for one. And yeah, in this demonstration, we're just transferring the leads over just to, to simplify things. But obviously, our leads are going to come from there onto the patient, and that patient's leads are going to come off. Happy with that? Okay, so now we're on monitoring. We're happy that the patient's stable. Infusions are running. We're off all infusions, so we're clear from this side of the patient. There's no suction or anything else that's uh, connected to the patient. So literally now, all we have is a ventilator and a, an entitled CO2. Happy with that? So now we're going to need some assistance, and in this case we're going to do a 15 degree log roll, pat slide in, back, and then slide over. Let's get some assistance. So as the, um, the team leader in this transfer, I'm going to take the tube. That's the thing that can, can cause problems. If there's a risk of a disconnecting during the retrieval, I will, you may have to disconnect, but most of the time we won't. But I'm going to hold the tube, and I'm going to make sure it doesn't come out. And we need to be really clear with everyone who's in charge, who's giving the orders, and what we're going to say. So I say, ready, brace, and roll, okay? But other people might say, one, two, three, go, or go on three. Okay, so everyone looking at me. Okay, I'm going to say, ready, brace, and roll. Okay, ready, brace, roll. Okay, ready, brace, roll. Now the, the question for us is whether we can get them over in one go. You can see that our stretches are narrow and there's a bridge on them. So very tall patients we might need to do diagonally and then bring their legs in. If there's a very long bed, very, sorry, very wide bed, we might need to do it in two steps, being ass assured that nothing's catching. But in this case, we're happy he's going to go over in one go. So everyone looking at me, keep an eye on that. If there's any problems, tell me and we'll stop. Okay, ready, brace, slide. Okay, so patient's over. Now we can begin the process of packaging them for transfer. The very, very last thing we usually will do is change over ventilation. Any idea why we do that last? In case it's just to dislodge, is it? So the oxygen doesn't run out. There's two reasons. One is our oxygen hose, uh, sorry, oxygen circuit, uh, ventilation circuit is short. So we can't generally reach the patient when they're in the bed. The second is that we're on portable oxygen, meaning that we could run out if we put them on too early and then we you know, get delayed. So the only exception to that is if a patient is extremely hard to ventilate, so they're on high FiO2s with high pressures, 
we might test ventilate them on our ventilator as one of the very first steps in the retrieval. Can you plug that ventilator into the hospital? You can. Oxygen supply? You can. But clearly, they, the wall is usually where the oxygen is, and that's at that end. So you just have to think that through. Happy with that? So 90% of the time, it's going to be ventilation last. But if someone's difficult to ventilate, we will likely to test ventilate them. The um, in this case, we've got them already. We're now going to package them. We're going to show you the sort of lasagna technique or layering technique. So what we're trying to avoid is all of these leads and tubes being tangled together and then at the other end being a nightmare to disentangle. And then if we have a problem en route, having an issue with troubleshooting things. Okay, so patient has some dirty things, things that we would like to avoid tangling up with monitoring, and those are the nasogastric tube, the indwelling catheter, chest tubes and things. So those are going to be on the bottom layer underneath um, the first sheet. So we'll have a look. So you've got any nasogastric that's, that's sitting there and it's going to be on the very bottom layer. Let's grab that. Okay. So once that's, once we're happy that's going to be on the bottom layer, we're going to cover the, the, this layer up. So now we've got a sheet on the patient and the dirty layer. Most people will have a sheet or blanket underneath the entire patient and that's going to form a wrap at the end and that just means the patient's cocooned, their arms are kept in position and they're kept warm and uh, well packaged. The second thing we've got are, are leads and, uh, and uh, infusions and you can choose either to do them all in one if it's uh, pretty straightforward or you could do separate, uh, separate uh, in this case we're going to put them all together and we're going to put another sheet on top. So now we've got the patient covered. And what are we going to need to access if um, the patient deteriorates? The IV. Great. So that IV line that I talked about on a pump set with some crystalloid running is going to be our emergency infusion port. So we need to have access to it. So it's connected to there and it's out <coughs> of the patient. We label it with a brightly coloured patient, uh, patient additive or drug additive label so that we can see where it is at all times, middle of the night, in the dark. And that, this is our lifeline. The patient deteriorates or needs some further treatment. If we need to give them paralytics or other things. Now we're going to wrap the patient and uh, change over the ventilator. So in this case, because we've got an Oxylog 3000 at either end, we can literally go from their circuit to our circuit. The 3000 plus takes disposable circuits as well as reusable circuits. And the vast majority of, um, of uh, hospitals in uh, in Sydney and their emergency departments will have Oxylog 3000 pluses. So that means we actually don't need to use our circuit at all, we can use theirs. We know their circuit's been working because we've been assessing the patient over the last 20 minutes, half an hour. And now we can simply do a changeover. Very good. So clearly you need to be in charge of driving this, you need to make sure the ventilator is set up correctly and ready to go. And uh, when you're ready you'll communicate with your colleague and we're going to do a changeover. So Lindsay, are you ready to go over the ventilator? I've checked it and got it ready. It's ready to go. Yep, ready. Okay, so it turns it on and we bring it over. Making sure we don't extubate the patient. So there are some patients where we need to be very careful of the, um, the ventilation during the transfer period. What happens when we disconnect a patient from a circuit? Excellent. So if the patient's very PEEP dependent, patients requiring recruitment maneuvers to maintain oxygenation or high PEEP. We need to do something to prevent that. And how can we do that? Clamp Excellent. Clamp the tube. So this is a routine thing for us to do. Clamp the tube in patients requiring PEEP. A few ways of doing it. You can either use the ones that are available in most intensive cares and they'll almost always be in intensive care and you can just clamp the tube. Or you can grab a pair of forceps and put some gauze on them to clamp it just to protect the tube. But this is a really routine thing to do for patients requiring PEEP and, and we'll avoid that desaturation and re-recruitment manoeuvres occurring. Can I ask, Eric, if uh, ED is using a reusable um, uh, circuit? They're all now pretty much disposables. Okay. Yeah. If they're using a reusable, then they probably won't let you have it. Yeah. Then we'd still use it. Our own one, our, our change over. Because they're all serialised and, and part of our yeah. stock. And you can see that Lindsay's packaged the patient the, the ventilator circuit is now strapped to this with this extremely expensive commercial device and uh, we are beautifully packaged. We can get uh, infusions into the patient and if necessary we can unpackage them and when, when we unpackage them they'll be in layers and we can troubleshoot. The other things that we might do 
um, is to just to package the head a bit more effectively. So we'll get a, a towel or usually a, a blanket. Um, just as a demonstration, I'll show you it on this sort of towel. And we simply just roll it up like this and tape it down and place it under the head. Do you mind lifting the head for me? As you can imagine, a, a blanket. That provides some head rolls, protects the head, stops it moving around during transfer. And obviously if we need to, we can sit the patient up to improve their ventilation and, uh, and, and protect their ICPs. At the other end, obviously, everything's going to be reversed. And again, if the patient's presser dependent, inotrope dependent, we're going to need to be really careful with the, the exchange. And that is the most common time when I find people are being very helpful by expediting things and they think they've got it all over it. You've been with that patient now for a while, you know how sensitive they are. And uh, this is where you need to be on your lookout and be the team leader and say, guys, this patient's very presser dependent, I'm going to be managing this. We need a double pump, we're going to do it slowly, we're going to take our time, we're not going to rush. Okay. The great thing is the NICU syringes can come off the bridge and onto the patient. So we could actually, you know, we can start infusion slowly and we can get the patient over. We don't need to have done everything before we move the patient. But, so it's one of the advantages. But you need to be absolutely on, your, on, your ball, on the ball with these cases of um, pressor and armotrope dependent patients. Excellent. Having the on the outside also just stops that gotcha where you see a two starts climbing because they're cold and everyone's wrapped them up nice and closely and they've and blocked off the that, tube or, or they've covered up the exit uh, exhalation. Okay. Yeah. So just um, you know, that's why it's the last thing that goes on. It's sitting out at the top so we can have a good inspection of it all the time. Excellent. Any questions about that? So in terms of your um, nine plus, would you elect to put it onto a central line? Uh, just purely because you know it's unlikely to tissue whilst peripheral line. It, it's your call. If you've got a, a spare central line access point, yes. Um, I'd use the brown line on a central line that I know is working. If you've got an arm line that uh, has been working well and flushes easily, that's an equivalent. So, sir, I don't think it's drugs, would you want the double pump in between? Say that again? Which one would you take? Double pump and all but you wouldn't with the sedation? Yes, so presses are ninotropes, so if noradrenaline, adrenaline's running, they've got vasopressin, something else like that. Yeah, the only ones that need to be double pumped, everything is else you can just... Is that because they're short acting? Or well, very short and hemodynamically important. Okay. If, um, the other things you might think, you've got to think about is, um, and we mentioned earlier about the length of the trip, so how much you've got uh, ready to go, is, there, is carrying any other drugs you might need for an emergency. So. Um, we have a little bag that's in the interhospital pack you saw, which is a little green bag that we, we um, carabiner to the patient so that when we're en route, we can keep all of the things we might need to give to them. So that would that may mean you might keep fentanyl there to give boluses of fentanyl for analgesia. It may be rocuronium or vecuronium, other paralytics, if you, if you want to paralyse the patient for intracranial pressure control. Um, anything else you might need on the trip. You're going to keep in that little bag, carabiner to the patient. It's not going to end up in your pockets and lost. You're not going to go home with the, the rock uranium and your wife ask you difficult questions about why you, you have paralytics in your pocket. Excellent. What the chair is just drunk. <laughs> Can I also ask, I mean, with your double pumping technique, you use two lumens of the central line. Yes. What yes. if you don't have a spare lumen? Um, well, then you have to balance that. You might have to use a three-way tap. Okay. okay. And in the current circumstance, you've got one of your lumens is still full of norad. Yes. Um, so, so I'd aspirate that and discard yeah. it. Good, good point. Any other questions? Excellent. Thanks, guys. We'll stop there. Thank you, Lindsay.